I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to my colleague, Nate Bernard. He is the manager of the main library at the Allen County Public Library, and he's going to do the introduction for us today. Thank you, Allison, and hello and good evening. Um, I'm very excited to uh, be here with all of you guys tonight, but the reason I'm excited is because the Genealogy Center excels at helping us learn about our story, who we are, where we came from, what makes us unique as individuals. And part of my story is that some years back when I was in college, I was lucky enough to meet our guest tonight, uh, my friend Jenny. And it's really exciting because at the time I was like, okay, you're an anthropology major. What do you do with an anthropology degree? And I have my answer now. And it is you become an internationally respected scientist and a best-selling author. And now I'm wondering, maybe I should have been an anthropologist. It's pretty cool. Um, so it's exciting to have her because her work is at the core of what the Genealogy Center does. It helps us find out who we are, where we came from, what our story is. And so with that, I would like to issue a warm welcome to Dr. Jennifer Rapp, who's gonna tell us all about her new book, Origins, and her work and how it can relate to genealogy, which is why we're all here. So welcome, Jenny. Nate, thank you so much. I am so honored to be here with you all. And uh, thank you to both you and to Allison for putting this together. And oh my gosh, I can't believe how many people are here. You guys, this is wonderful. Thank you for coming. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera off until after told the Q&A and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, so hi everybody. I'm really sorry that I can't be giving this talk in person, but I really appreciate the chance to talk to you all, even if it's virtual. And I guess I'm reaching a lot more people this way than I would uh, in person. So that's the, the benefit to this, I guess. Um, so just to share where I am today, I am speaking to you from my office at the University of Kansas, <clears throat> NCAA champs, <clears throat> um, <laughs> on the top of Mount Oread, which is really just a big hill in Lawrence, Kansas. And the land that KU occupies, um, just to give you a bit of history, was taken from the Ka or Kansa, the Osage and the Shawnee nations. And many tribes were forced into and out of Kansas prior to statehood. Uh, Kansas has a very, very complicated history, which is um, definitely worth learning about if you are interested. Today, the state of Kansas is home to the Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation, the Kickapoo Tribe in Kansas, the Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri in Kansas and Nebraska, and the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska. And because Lawrence is the home of the Haskell Indian Nations University, many American Indian and Alaska Native people from across the United States have ongoing ties to this region. In fact, we just had a big powwow last week. I think it was last week, very recently, um, and it was just truly wonderful. So I think I think it's really important to understand and acknowledge the history of places throughout the Americas. And this is an important step in equity and justice for past harms, but it's only the first step. And so members of our research group really strive to return tangible benefits to the indigenous communities with, with, with whom we share space and collaborate and on whose land we work. And I'd be happy to chat with you later if you're interested in how we do that. All right, so today I'm going to be talking to you about how we use genetics, especially ancient DNA, um, to understand the past and specifically the latest scientific understandings of how the first peoples came to the Americas. This is a really fascinating story for many of us because these were the last continents to be explored. Um, by, by modern humans. They were the last step on our global journey. And there are many, many questions about this process, like who were these first people? Why did they travel? How did they survive the harsh conditions of the last ice age and so forth? We once thought we really had a good idea of how people came here. We thought we knew this story, but we've had to revise our models many times in the last few decades. And um, much of this is thanks to the introduction of a new kind of data, um, complete genomes from uh, humans, both living humans and their ancestors. And this story has gotten so complicated and we're learning so many details each year that it's really hard for even 
researchers in this field like myself to keep up. So one of the things that I did with my book and one of my goals of talking to you today is that I hope I'll be able to give you an accessible summary of the state of the science so that when you hear of new results that are going to come out in the future, probably next week or next month, I mean, this, I'm not kidding when I say that things are being published so quickly. Um, but when you hear these new results, you'll be able to contextualize them. But I also want to note that as we go through this talk, please be aware that there have been some pretty nefarious attempts to use stories about Native American origins as tools for disenfranchisement, for land theft, and for genocide. I, I really want us all to be mindful of this history, although it's unfortunately not something I can do justice to in this short talk. I do go into it at length in my book. So if that is something that you feel you'd like to learn more about, um, my book has a lot of references that you could you could read um, more on. Okay, so there are many approaches to studying the past and none of these approaches gives us a complete answer by itself. So many Native American societies have histories of their own origins, which have been transmitted mostly orally for many generations. And some of these oral traditions align with scientific ways of studying the past and some do not. Um, and my focus is on other ways of studying the past, especially archaeology and genetics. But before I start, I want to respectfully acknowledge the many, many ancient perspectives on these histories, or I should say modern perspectives that are rooted in ancient histories, right? These, these oral traditions that have been passed down from generation to generation. And some of these are understood to be metaphorical, and some are taken as literal explanations of origins. Um, and events in the past unfolded in a particular way, of course, but our ability to understand what happened is limited by the tools that we use and the data that we have available. And definitely, archaeology and genetics sometimes tell us different stories about the past. So although I prioritize genetics as a tool for understanding the past in my own research, I want to caveat that by saying the stories that DNA tell are not complete or the only way to understand how history may have unfold, unfolded. Okay, so I call myself an anthropological geneticist, and that's not a term that most people hear every day. So just to define it quickly, um, it's a synthetic field, anthropological genetics is. We use the methods and theory of population genetics to answer evolutionary and cultural questions. Um, and this, um, is, I think, a pretty holistic way of looking at the past. So we train very, very broadly in multi, mul multiple disciplines. Okay, so let's get to some history here. If you're my age or older, I won't say how old I am, but if you're my age or older, you may have learned what we call the Clovis First model of Native American origins. And so this model um, took into account this apparent sudden and widespread appearance of people who made um, what we call the Clovis techno complex, which is characterized by points like the one you see on your screen. Um, and this was seen in the archeological record of North America around 13,000 years ago, very suddenly. And then shortly after that, we see the extinction of American megafauna. So these giant mammoths and mastodons and woolly rhinoceroses and dire wolves um, about a thousand years later. And so this model developed, which stated that the ancestors of these Clovis peoples came from Siberia, where they led a rugged existence hunting these, these massive Ice Age beasts. Um, and they crossed the Bering Land Bridge near the end of the late Pleistocene and moved swiftly down a corridor, which opened up between these ice sheets here. Um, and then populated the continents. And this was a very elegant model. It was very, it accounted for almost all the evidence. It really made sense. It was simple. It, everybody liked it. And it persisted for nearly 50 years. And this model was so entrenched in the archaeological community that um, any site that seemed to predate 13,000 years ago was immediately rejected. But this evidence, this contrary evidence, kept popping up more and more and more of it. Um, evidence that showed that people were in the Americas prior to Clovis. 
And so today, the majority of archaeologists, although certainly not all, in fact, there was just a paper out this week, I think, that kind of pushed back on this a bit, but the majority of archaeologists accept a pre-Clovis presence of people in the Americas, that is, people here prior to 13,000 years ago. But when? <laughs> That's the big question, right? When did people get here and who were they? And genetics has helped to provide some answers to these questions. So DNA can tell us about the biological relationships between individuals living in the present and in the past. And this means that the human genome is an archive of population history. So there are evolutionary forces that act on all populations, including natural selection, genetic drift, mutation, gene flow. And these change the genetic composition of populations. And this evolutionary history can be reconstructed using the tools of population genetics. When reconstructing population histories, geneticists can rely on different aspects of our genome. So mitochondrial DNA, or mtDNA, as I abbreviated here because I didn't have a lot of space, um, it's present in the mitochondria of your cells. And these are the, the little organelles in your cells that make energy. And it's a separate genome from your nucleus and the chromosomes found in your nucleus. This DNA is maternally inherited and it's what we call non-recombining. So it doesn't swap genes in and out like your chromosomes do. And it's present in hundreds to thousands of copies per cell, which I kind of abbreviate with these little cartoons here, little DNA cartoons. Um, I'm not really a great graphic designer. <laughs> so, these factors make it an ideal target of ancient DNA work, which, as we'll discuss shortly, ancient DNA is fragmented and scarce. And so it's a lot easier to get mitochondrial DNA when there's many more copies of it than to get other kinds of DNA. Um, and there are many ancient and modern DNA studies based on mitochondrial DNA, but it has a limitation. It only gives information about a tiny subset of your ancestors. So your mother and her mother and her mother and so on. So this gives you an accurate but very incomplete and low resolution glimpse of history as I kind of characterize it as, um, you know, some of the pieces of a puzzle, maybe the edge pieces of a puzzle, which I guess these aren't, but, um, and they can tell you, you can get an idea of this, the picture from them, but it's very uh, limited. So. To get a more detailed picture, you need to examine nuclear DNA, which is the genome present in your chromosomes. And in contrast to the roughly 16,500 A's, G's, C's, and T's found in mitochondrial DNA, the haploid nuclear genome has about 3.1 billion DNA bases. That's billion with a B. Um, and that has, that's about 30,000 genes for anybody who's keeping track. <laughs> so Unlike mitochondrial DNA, nuclear DNA is present in only two copies per cell. So one copy for mom, you get one set of chromosomes from mom, one set from dad. This means it's much less abundant in ancient human remains, and that makes it much more difficult to retrieve. But it is a vastly more powerful tool for population genetics when you can recover it. And that's because your nuclear genome contained in your chromosomes is inherited from both parents. And so it reflects the histories of many, many, many thousands of ancestors, not just those on your maternal lineage. And so it gives you many puzzle pieces, millions of puzzle pieces, uh, including the middle pieces. And that allows you to reconstruct a highly detailed picture of human history. So the really exciting thing these days is that we can get all these puzzle pieces from ancient peoples, sometimes, as well as those living today. And, and I'm talking about paleogenomics here, or the study of complete ancient genomes. And I've mentioned ancient DNA a few times now, so I just want to note that the study of ancient DNA has been so crucial for developing our new understanding of the his earliest histories of the Americas. Um, and when I'm talking about ancient DNA, I'm really referring to DNA from deceased organisms. It, it, they could be recently deceased. They could be very old um, dead for a very long time. But it kind of more depends on um, the properties of the DNA. And it's very, very degraded and scarce. It's very, very hard to recover. Um, 
but it's a valuable tool. It gives us a direct window into past populations. So you can say at this time, we know these genetic variants were present in this person at this geographic location. And that is so powerful for our models. Unfortunately, because ancient DNA is so degraded and fragmented, it's really sensitive to modern contamination. And there are very few samples that are appropriate to work with. Most don't preserve whole genomes. Um, so it's, and it's technically challenging to take the precautions needed to ensure that DNA from an ancient sample is uncontaminated. If a person is not doing the research in a lab like this, you cannot trust their results. Um, that's, it just boils down to that. Uh, and this is, you know, the kind of, this is, gives you an, a glimpse into what it's like working in ancient DNA. You, you really get used to the smell of bleach, which we use for uh, decontamination. Okay, so in the next few slides, I'm going to summarize for you what researchers have learned in recent years about the origins of Native Americans from ancient and modern genomes. Okay, so this is a complicated slide. Uh, <laughs> first, all of the complete ancient genomes that have been recovered from the Americas so far show us that the first peoples of the Americas, as well as some other populations, have two major ancestry components. The majority of their ancestry comes from the ancient peoples of East Asia. And the other major ancestral population, which was discovered through the sequencing of the remains of, sadly, a little toddler who lived 24,000 years ago at an upper Paleolithic site called Malta. Um, and that tells us about a population known as the we call the ancient North Siberians. Now they wouldn't have called themselves that, of course, but that's what geneticists call them. And um, so these are the two major branches that contribute to Native American uh, ancestry. And we also see evidence for an ancestral component um, in some Amazonian groups that's related to present day Australasians. And that's a really surprising finding, which um, has been termed population Y. Now, what you might think automatically is, oh, Australasia, South America, oh, well, there's obviously a trans-Pacific migration by boat. Um, you know, we, have, we hear all the stories of people making journeys that way. In fact, I'm not going to get into the details because this talk is not going to be long enough or technical enough, but when you look at the signature that this ancestry um, leaves on the genomes, it is not consistent with that model. It does not match what we, would, we geneticists would expect to see from that kind of scenario. Instead, it's much older. And in fact, we see that ancient um, ancestry signal in a 40,000-year-old individual from China. So how do we how do we interpret all these different pieces of evidence? Why do we have this strange connection? Well, the most parsimonious explanation for these results is that both the um, South Americans who have this population Y ancestry and contemporary Australasians have ancestry from a as yet unsampled population that was around here somewhere and just a little bit of ancestry, but it's um, really fascinating and something that I would keep an eye on and see if we can learn more about in the next coming years. Okay, so back to this. So we've got two major branches of ancestry and then maybe possibly this other population. Um, so following the mixing of these different branches, we've got Paleo-Siberians here, you can kind of ignore that. We won't get into that today, but um, the ancestors of the first peoples were isolated for several thousands of years. And that is when they evolved genetic variants that are seen only in Native Americans. And I want to talk for a minute about this isolation. So many of us think that this isolation must have taken place in Beringia itself, this land connection that would have existed between East Asia and um, uh, Northwest Alaska at the height of the last glacial maximum or, um, well, sorry, during the, the last glacial maximum or the ice age, right? When sea levels were so much lower that this land was exposed. And um, during that time, during the last glacial maximum, this climactic event, the paleo, the climate was just really not great <laughs> for humans. 
people across the world retreated into refugia um, from the cold, from the dryness, where they could find places where they could find resources. And the majority of um, Siberia was actually depopulated. So one of the places that we think people may have gone would have been this um, coastline of Beringia, which uh, of central Beringia, which paleoclimactic reconstructions have shown us would have been a relatively decent place to live. So it would have had warmer temperatures thanks to the ocean currents, um, higher plant productivity and birds and marine mammals and fish to live on. So that is one place where people may have been isolated. Um, which would explain this signal we see in the genetic record of complete isolation of the ancestors of Native Americans. But I got to stress that we don't actually have any direct archaeological evidence of people being here because it's underwater <laughs> today. So we can't go there to look for archaeological sites unless we have some kind of submarine technology. Um, I'm not sure that's possible. So that's unfortunate. Um, there are some hints as shown in this slide that there may have been maybe some potential occupation by people during the last glacial maximum. So as early as 34,000 to maybe 24,000 years ago at these sites here, um, they're very indirect though. It's like lake core sediments that maybe have biomarkers that look like human feces maybe, or um, bluefish caves, maybe some cut marks on some bone that maybe look like human cut marks, right? They're very controversial. A lot of archaeologists are skeptical of these, so stay tuned. Um, we may have some more answers in the future. So, in the so the where the Beringian incubation took place might have been Beringia. It might have been somewhere else. I like the idea that it was here, but you know we, we have yet to have strong evidence, archaeological ground truthing yet. Okay, so I'm going to move on. Um, as the population ancestral to Native Americans was isolated, I'm going to go ahead and put them in Beringia, although we don't show the land connection here right now. But let's imagine the land connection here. We've got this isolated population. It starts splitting into several subgroups. And we can see that from the genetic record. We don't need the archaeological record to show us that. In fact, the archaeological record doesn't show us this. One of the subgroups stays here in Alaska and is represented by genomes sampled from individuals at these two sites. Um, this population is somewhat confusingly named ancient Beringians. <laughs> um, the other subgroups, um, one becomes ancestral to Native Americans and moves uh, south of the ice sheets that we're covering here. And another one, we don't have direct genetic evidence of, which is why we call it unsampled population A, we can see its signature in the genomes of um, present-day Central Americans, the Miche. Okay, so that's another thing that we have yet to learn more. We, we are excited to learn more about with more genomes, hopefully. Okay, so the splitting takes place. And then the next major thing that happens is the North American glaciers begin to melt. So this whole area here is blocked by ice, um, but pathways through it begin to open up. And the first one that opens up is along the West Coast about 17,000 years ago. The, the Earth is the, globally, it's, it's warming, um, ice sheets are melting, and it starts to melt along the coast first, making this route of travel um, accessible earlier about uh, uh, sometime after 17,000 years ago. The next route that opens up is the one that you saw a few slides ago. That's the one kind of in the, through the interior corridor. We call it the ice-free corridor. That becomes accessible at least by 13,000 years ago, possibly a bit earlier. So first route, second route. Which one do people take first? Well, I favor the model that people came down along the coast because we see the division of Native American genomes into two clusters, one called NNA or Northern Native Americans, which are actually here, so you can see that, NNA. The other called Southern Native Americans, which is like basically everybody along here. And that division takes place sometime between about 17,500 and 14,600 years ago. We also see, and I don't have them on the map, but we have, we have, um, sites, archaeological sites in South America and Mexico, other places, um, and in North America that predate the formation of the opening of the ice-free corridor. So people moved down here earlier. 
Um, and I think it's more likely to move by, um, by boat along the coast than by an overland route. Um, there's some genetic reasons for believing that as well, but I'm gonna need to move on so we can stay on time. Um, okay, in recent years, this is totally just a, a, an excuse to throw up cute dog pictures. In recent years, we've also been able to get um, insights from the genomes of dogs who would have traveled with the first peoples. And this is a wonderful, well, it's an adaptation of a wonderful study that was done um, by Perry et al., um, Angela Perry, uh, in 2020, comparing the branching patterns of dog mitochondrial lineages. These are, these are all the American ones. So you can see there's a split here, Northeast Asian dogs and North American dogs. And you can see they split into these lineages here and they rated about 15,000 years ago. And if you look down at humans here, we see 15.7 thousand years ago is the date for that split. So that's pretty close. And you also see these, these lineages splitting and there's one, two, three, four, five, right? And we've got four lineages here. So that's actually pretty close. Um, I'm, I'm pretty impressed by this. I'm looking forward to seeing more nuclear genomes um, done with this. Okay, so real quick, as far as when we have pretty solid evidence of human presence in the Americas by 14,500 years ago, maybe 15,000 years ago, there are some sites that are except, um, that are a bit controversial date to around 15 to 16,000 years ago, some which are even more controversial, which predate 16,000 years ago, okay? Um, and these are the genetics dates here. This, the splitting of Native Americans south of the ice sheet um, happened between about 17,500 and 14,600 years ago. But this really neat story may have been complicated. <laughs> so a recent discovery in archaeology, um, a site was published from New Mexico that has evidence of human footprints, and these are just extraordinary. And they span a period of over 2,000 years. And it's not just human footprints, it's megafauna. They were interacting with mastodons, they were interacting with giant brown sloths, um, these are mostly children and young people, um, these footprints, and they have been dated to 23,000 to 25,000 years ago, which, you know, is the height of the last glacial maximum. Everybody's supposed to be in Beringia and Siberia at that point, right? So we have to figure this out, um, and I'm really excited about this uh, and what it means for our models, that perhaps there were people here before that genetic record shows us. Perhaps these were population Y folks, right? Um, so the, we're widely speculating at this point. Um, I wanna stress though, some archeologists take issue with the dates um, for technical reasons I can get into in the Q&A if you're interested. Um, I am pretty convinced by them, but I'm not an archeologist, so I have to put that caveat in. Okay. So I want to kind of wrap things up by talking a little bit about genetics and ancestry. And I know this is of special interest to you guys. Um, I would say genetics is a really powerful tool. And I don't have to tell you, because I'm sure you are at the forefront of this. People are using it to research their own histories and are doing some amazing things with ancestry testing. These are really exciting uh, developments. And I am really, really happy to see them um, happening. But there are some serious problems when ancestry testing companies deliberately conflate genetic ancestry with cultural identity or ethnicity, as Ancestry DNA did a while back in this video of a woman who was talking about how she discovered she had Native American ancestry while standing with cultural items specific to a particular tribe. And many people here have family legends of Native Americans in their past. I am always hearing about people's excitement about their Cherokee great-grandmother and getting questions about how they might use DNA to confirm this story. People even email me their genetic ancestry testing results. Please don't, please don't do that. <laughs> I won't answer those emails. It's, um, it's a little bit intrusive for me to look at them. I don't, I don't like to do that. But we love having a story that connects us to the past and imagining our ancestors. And this is normal and healthy and understandable. But I just want to stress that having Native American DNA, quote unquote, is not what makes someone Native American. So we may love family traditions of having Native American ancestries, but that's not what makes a person indigenous. Genetic testing can be a start to establishing a connection with one's indigenous ancestry, but it cannot serve as a substitute for the work of building ties to a community. So it can be a first step, but it's 
it's not enough. Um, tribes determine their membership through a variety of ways, but commercial ancestry testing isn't one of them. And um, one of the thing, quotes that I really like from a research study on this subject was an interview with somebody who said, we don't need a swab in our mouth to prove who we are. Um, in other words, DNA does not define who's Native American. And this is not a minor or abstract issue for Indigenous peoples, because if you give legitimacy to the notion that one can claim Native identity via a DNA test or a family legend without connection to present-day tribes, this is an implicit threat to tribal sovereignty. So um, this an Ill illegitimate claiming of Native American identity and the reaping of benefits designed for um, businesses or other social and educational benefits, this is a widespread problem. And so I'll just you know, I'll just say this, what makes a person indigenous is not a subject on which I or any other non-native geneticist can speak with any authority or knowledge. Um, so I just want to put that caveat out there. And I want to wrap up the talk by acknowledging the indigenous and non-indigenous scholars whose work has informed my thinking on these issues and stress that much of what I talked about today is built on a foundation of indigenous academic and public scholarship. And these are some, but by no means all, of the people who have influenced my approaches and thinking. Um, okay, so we've fairly scratched the surfaces. I could talk about this for two hours or more, but uh, I want to um, give you ways to contact me if you would like. I got to stress, I am a bit overwhelmed these days, um, so it might take me a while to get back to you. Uh, if you're interested in learning about our, um, our research or supporting our research, I put the, the uh, website of our lab group here. Of course, here's my book. This is my uh, website, although I never update it, at least not recently. So I'm going to try and do that in the future. And then these are my social media um, contacts. And so I want to thank you all so much. And I will be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So I will go ahead and turn my camera back on. I've got a few for you and you know many more as we get into this presentation. So we will start um, with one that I am not sure how to answer myself, but you are an expert. So um, is nuclear DNA the same as autosomal DNA? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, so um, kind of. So how do I say this? Um, all autosomal DNA is nuclear DNA, but not all nuclear DNA is autosomal DNA. In other words, autosomal DNA refers to your chromosomes that are not your sex chromosomes, everything but your X and Y. Okay. There you go. <laughs> okay. Um, so here's another one too. Um, if the Ust Ishim, and I don't know if I'm saying that correct. Ishim, um, I think. Okay, is 45,000 years ago, and Africa is 40,000 years ago. Why are we told that mitochondria, mitochondrial Eve is from Africa instead of the East Ishim region? Oh, okay, yeah. So first of all, um, the out of Africa is, we pushed that date much earlier. It's much, much earlier. Okay, so it's, I think, um, oh gosh, I'd have to look it up again, but I think that the major migration out of Africa takes place I want to say 80 to 100,000 years ago. Oh gosh, I can answer that. But it's it's earlier than 40,000 years for sure. Um, and even earlier forays of people out of Africa into different parts of the world, they don't seem to have been the major migration. Um, I'm going to have to look this up now so I don't embarrass myself. But um, yeah, so there were people, modern humans evolved, and then there were um, some some initial forays out of Africa. But the reason we know people were that anatomically modern Homo sapiens came from Africa initially is, first of all, that's where the earliest archaeological evidence of anatomically modern Homo sapiens is. It's the earliest um, fossils, mm -hmm. uh, uh, features like us, including chins. Um, and if you look at the DNA from everybody in the world that we have sequenced, um, the vast, vast majority of human genetic variation is seen in modern day populations in Africa, which is the, exactly the pattern you would expect to see if that's where we evolved from. And you can actually try to fancy models that show that people came from Africa. So um, always take these dates, and I just gave you a whole bunch of dates, and I would just say always take them with a grain of salt if they're determined just from genetics. Um, just as you would if you're if they're determined from the archaeological record, right? These are approximations, and they can change given more evidence. So you know, yeah, caveat. Awesome. Okay, 
Um, here's another one too, maybe, maybe have something like this. However it is done, has anyone ever tried saving their DNA for a future family tree time capsule? Oh, have you that's heard of any sort question. of project? Yeah, I don't know about that. That's a great question. That would be interesting. Probably, since you thought of it, I'm sure. <laughs> Good idea. All right, cool. Moving on to the next one. The Denovians seem to be a newer line. Have they played any part in the settlement of the Americas? Um, you mean Denisovans, I think, is what you're talking yeah, about. I, the, the other kind of archaic hu um, human. Yeah, the other kind. Okay. Yes. Um, great, great question. So we don't have fossils from them or Neanderthals, anybody but anatomically modern Homo sapiens in um, the Americas. In fact, the oldest human remains from the Americas um, dates to, I want to say, 12,600 years ago. I think. <laughs> I think that's right. um, and, and as, of course, anatomically modern Homo sapiens. Um, Denisovans are interesting because we don't have much in the way of fossil evidence of them. I have a few few bones. Um, the majority of things that we know about them come from their genomes. And what the genetic evidence tells us, shows us, is that there were, we, we call this primly integration events, but it means sex, right? There was sex between our kind of human and Denisovans multiple times. Um, and that led to a Denisovan genetic legacy in anatomically modern Homo sapiens in various places. And um, kind of like if you were to drip I don't know, food coloring and water in different places, you would see it kind of spread out. Um, and if you were just freeze every face back where the drips originally took place, um, uh, just based on the density of the food coloring, you can do that sort of with genetics as well. And so they've seen, they've traced where these integration events kind of happened in different places. Um, all of the, these models show us that they took place before people entered the Americas and Denisovans themselves, as far as did not enter the Americas, unless they did and didn't leave any archeological or genetic traces. Native Americans do have uh, Denisovan ancestry. Um, and in some places it's really interesting. It gives us some really interesting patterns, but um, they don't have more of it than we would expect if that from those integration events that happened in Asia, if that makes sense. So we don't see evidence. That's a long way of saying we don't see evidence for Denisovans in, in the America. But uh, it's a pretty cool, pretty cool thing. Oh, man, that was actually a really fascinating answer. Thank you. I'm learning Thanks. quite a bit tonight. This is really cool. <laughs> um, so, so not all of the North American Native Americans are Clovis. Uh, what is the main difference between uh, Clovis theory and modern theory? Oh, yeah. OK, so, um, so the Clovis first idea, so the, the Clovis people's I'm not supposed to call them that. The people who use the Clovis techno complex, I'm trying to be precise for the argument, um, are seen <clears throat> really like mostly east of the Rocky Mountains. And they kind of, this, this archaeological signature appears, the scene, the dates that I see that I trust are like 13,000 years ago, roughly. And they persist for only a few hundred years. Fascinating, actually. Yeah. And they're very widespread. Kind of, there's another group, or another group of people, at least, they may, they were the, probably the same group of people genetically, right? Because I, I think we know that now. But they were using a different kind of tool called Western Stem Point. Um, they look slightly different from Clovis Points. They were around at about the same time, maybe a little bit earlier. Um, and then, of course, we have pre-Clovis sites. And which pre-Clovis sites you accept as being um, legitimate evidence of human presence is really depends on like what your standards are. And some archeologists accept none of them, um, but they're kind of in the minority. Some archeologists accept all of them and they're also kind of in the minority. Um, the majority of archeologists, and I have talked to many of them um, trying to get their take on this. The majority of archeologists would accept them, the ones that, um, a bunch of different ones kind of ranging in date 14,000 to maybe 15,000 years ago, some a little bit earlier than that. Um, and I would say that based on those sites and kind of the genetic evidence, the main peopling event south of the ice sheets probably took place shortly after, I interpret it anyway, after the melting of the ice sheets away from the coast about 17,000 years ago, rather than via an interior route 13,000 years ago, if that makes sense. 
And again, we've got this white sand site. Who knows? Maybe there was a people <laughs> before that, right? So we have to we have to keep an open mind. Cool. So we, we have had a request. If you could post your contact info slide again. Um, oh, yeah, sure. We can talk over that. That's no problem. I will also add that we are recording this. It will be posted to our YouTube site. Um, yeah. So if you miss something, you can always go back and check it. Okay, sure. I got to share my screen again. Okay. Yeah, um, no I am also happy to share. I, I will share my email with you guys in the in the chat, but you got to promise me not to email me until after the semester ends. <laughs> <laughs> not to expect an answer until after the semester ends to like late May. <laughs> it's my All right. So, <laughs> that's cool. So, so this one actually is pretty. This one I find interesting too. How accurate is the 23andMe genetic history? Does your book also cover Asian to Europe migrations? And is it still the main belief that the seat of civilization for everyone is Africa? We also ask, is your book illustrated with some of the charts you displayed tonight? Yes, those charts are right from the book. So um, yeah, because I, I am a terrible graphic designer. So I had a graduate student, I paid her, but I had a graduate student make them for me. And I use those in there, and then I just keep reusing them because I can't make new um, new slides or new images. Um, yes, those are in there as well. Some beautiful photos, I think. Um, archaeologists were very generous in sharing their their uh, their photos with me. Yeah, Africa is still the unquestioned question, at least among scholars and scientists and geneticists and archaeologists, um, uh, homeland for our species. Um, that is not controversial at all. And 23andMe is, yeah, I mean, I don't really get into it in the book, and I don't really super talk about the migration of people into Europe. That's a topic for maybe another book down the, down the line. We'll see. We'll see. Um, but the 23andMe gives you some really fascinating insights into your genetic ancestry. It's a very powerful tool. Um, just understand some caveats with it, right? They are um, comparing your DNA to um, databases and the results are gonna be only as good as the representation in the database. So for example, uh, indigenous peoples of the Americas are not well represented. And there are a lot of reasons for that, primarily among them being the fact that our discipline, my discipline has had a really, um, abusive history of treating and shameful history of treating Native Americans and their ancestors in, in very poor ways. And that has led to a breakdown of trust. Um, I go through that also in my book, if you're interested. Um, I think it's a really, really important topic to understand when you're, you're thinking about this field. Um, I think we're moving in a better direction, but I think it's really important that if we're going to get there, we really understand this history and how to avoid the mistakes and the um, the bad practices of the past and the present. Um, but so that is to say that there are populations like the indigenous peoples of the Americas for various complicated reasons are not well represented in these databases. Um, but, you know, when you take a 23andMe test and you get your results back, um, you know, it is a pretty accurate de description of how you are related to other populations in the database. Now, does that mean that you, if you have ancestors, it, listen, let me take it, take it back. If it, if, if it says I am 23% Irish, right? That doesn't mean my ancestors necessarily came from Ireland or 23% of my ancestors came from Ireland. That means I share a certain amount of my genome, genetic variants that they measure with people who live in Ireland today, unless they specifically incorporate ancient DNA into their work. I don't know, because it's been a while since I've looked, whether or not they do. It's hard to make very um, definitive inferences of um, your specific ancestors back, right? Um, because people move around. But overall, it's pretty, pretty accurate. Um, you'll see the percentages change. They'll send you updated reports, and that's often because um, they're adding new data to the databases. And so then they rerun analyses. And so the results change, right? So that's, that's uh, fluid because the results are dependent on, on the database. So there you oh. go. I hope that answered your questions. <laughs> oh man, there's so much we could ask. Um, I have a couple questions about South America. So I'm gonna kind of read them as a group. Um, one asks, um, if they missed it, do we have the approximate years that South America was settled? And another uh, watcher mentions that they 
heard of an underwater cave in Brazil, which contained an ancient girl. Did her DNA show any surprises? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I didn't get into South America as much as I should have. Um, again, I only really had 30 minutes to talk, but, um, and I got to, I was focused on kind of the getting past Alaska, oh, yeah, but, right. um, but yes, uh, people got into South America. Well, it's controversial. So you will have, again, I'm, I hate to be wishy-washy about this, but I'm trying to be accurate. You will have, there are some sites in South America that have been proposed as evidence of human occupation, or at least presence, to date as early as 30,000 years ago or 20,000 years ago. Those, unlike white sands, are controversial for um, the reason that they're not as definitive evidence of human presence. They're not footprints. They're more like broken rocks. And are these broken rocks deliberately manufactured by humans? Or are they, um, you know, uh, what we call geofacts, right? Rocks breaking because of natural processes. It's really hard to figure out if an ancient site, how old an ancient site is, and if people were actually there. But there are some sites that are claimed that are 20, 30,000 years in, in South America and Central America. More accept, commonly accepted sites are places like Monte in Chile, which date to 14,000, 2,000, 14,200, 14,000 something years ago. Um, and although there isn't one in Monte Verde, that's a bit more controversial, right? So people were probably in South America pretty quickly. Genetic evidence shows very close connections between um, some of the ancient, the oldest genomes uh, recovered in Brazil and um, a child in Montana all very far distant apart, but they're very closely related, which suggests an extremely rapid migration, which to me is more fitting with this model of people quote, rather than more slowly dispersing by land. Um, I think it's pretty strong evidence of that, in fact. Um, and then your question about Naya, um, there's a, there, there was a, the remains of a, of a young woman found, um, as you say, in, in a cave in Mexico underwater. Um, her Real DNA was recovered and published. Um, I don't think it was particularly surprising, except that it belonged to the lineage D4H3A, which is one, I haven't even talked about the lineages, you don't need to worry about it, but it is one that's seen more commonly in ancient peoples than in contemporary peoples, um, although you do see it, contemporary um, indigenous peoples. Um, it's less common, and that is um, probably simply the result of genetic drift, which is random changes in lineage frequency over time. Um, there were some problems with the study, though. There were some contamination issues, I think. I can't really remember, um, but I don't think they got a nuclear genome from her, or at least not one that was super reliable yet. So maybe stay tuned on that one. I didn't do that. I wasn't participating in that work, so... Um, Follow-up question to that. Um, one of our watchers says they're under the impression that there were human remains at Monte Verde. I, or is it Mesa Verde? Well, certainly a Mesa Verde, yeah. Monte Verde, the, the really old site in Chile, I don't okay. know. There might have been human remains, but no, I don't know. Um, there were certainly, you know, footprints there, really amazingly preserved organic material. I mean, a super cool site. Monte Verde is the site that really kind of broke the Clovis barrier for a lot of okay. archaeologists. Yeah, but I don't know if there were human remains or if there were, they were not widely reported or I don't know. <laughs> Ask Tom Dillahay, archaeologist. He's two excavates there. I'm learning a tremendous amount. This is exciting for me to, um, you know, view and, and, and ask these questions. I'm learning just as much as our viewers tonight. So another question. Um, do you think some people came into America before the continents divided? Or unless you mean, oh wait, do you mean before Beringia flooded? I, I, yeah, okay, um, yes, 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 I think so. That's okay. my, okay, sorry, I was a little confused about that. Um, do I think, yeah, absolutely, well, we know they did, we know they did, they had to, they traveled across the, the Bering Land Bridge, we see very strong evidence for that. Um, I thought you meant Pangea, and I was confused. <laughs> I was like, okay. I by then. Um, yeah, yeah. So I had a follow-up to the Monteverde question, specifically mentioning it was the, the Tim White dig. Are you familiar with that? The Tim White dig, where? No, I'm not familiar with that. Can you give okay. me a bit? All right, um, for our user asked that question, if you wanted to submit more context for me to pass on to Jenny, I'd be happy to do that. Yes. Um, 
while, while we work on that, I do have another question for you. Um, what do you see as the future of ancient DNA? Where does it go uh, from here? Yeah, Thanks, we're looking Nick. backwards but forwards at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what I see really clever people in my field doing is one of the things they're doing is getting DNA from soil, ancient DNA from soil. Oh my gosh, it's so cool. They can, with some caveats, reconstruct the fauna that were present on a, like, an, on a landscape at like these various periods of time. They can figure out what animals were there, um, the relative abundances, maybe. I mean, that's kind of, that's a little, little sketch, I guess. But yeah, it's really cool. Another fascinating development that I've seen, um, uh, especially led by Christina Warner, is um, getting DNA from plaque that's been scraped off of teeth. And you can get at what people were eating um, and uh, what kinds of um, pathogens they might have had in their mouths, right? So super cool stuff. And also on DNA, right? Looking at domesticates or animals that, or, or pathogens that are associated with human populations and using those as proxies for understanding um, population history. That's a good way forward, I think, especially when you want to minimize doing ancient DNA research on ancestral remains, right? Which is a concern, a big and big and very valid concern that a lot of tribes have. They're like, we don't want our ancestors' remains disturbed for this research. Enough, I get it. Um, I think we need to respect that and we must respect that. Um, but they may be more okay with, you know, getting DNA from ancient dogs. Maybe, maybe not. Um, it's always important that we prioritize the tribe's wishes when we do our research. That is of paramount importance. And I think that's also an area that I've seen incredible progress lately, and I'm, I'm really happy at the direction the field is going, which is improvements in um, ethical, respectful um, relationships with tribe researchers working with tribes instead of at their expense. Um, and I, I want to see more of that, and I think we will. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I have another question here. We have a little bit of time left, so we got time for a few more here. So um, you talk of the migration of peoples. In reality, how did they travel? Was it over centuries, or did they live in a long live in an area for long periods of time before moving on? Why did they migrate? Was it climate, food, shelter, any other reasons? Yes, all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> you, you listed so many different possibilities, and, and <laughs> human behavior is so complicated, right, and so complex. And I think when we use genetics and archaeology in combination, we can get at answers to those questions. Um, and when we do, we see that it's many different reasons and many different scenarios. So we see people, for example, at the Yana rhinoceros horn site in um, Siberia. Let me just go back a few slides. Can I do that? Do you guys still see my slides? I think. Yeah. Okay. Let me just zip back. Sorry if I'm making anybody dizzy. Right here, the Yana rhinoceros horn site up here above the Arctic Circle, 31,000 just incredible people were living and thriving up there and they were living year round permanently at these settlements up here um, that long ago and they built shelters they lived they hung out there um, for a long period of time and it was one of the things that we think drove the um, movement of peoples and potentially these meetings of these different populations um, was migration perhaps because of climate, right? Because the change in climate, moving into the last glacial maximum, get, things are getting colder and colder, drier. You're seeing desertification, is that a word? Of a lot of areas in, in um, the Northern hemisphere and animals and plants are, are moving and people are moving to follow them, right? So that's one um, scenario. People were moving in complicated ways and they're not always visible to us in the archeological record. So, you know, I'll go forward a few slides. We see, um, we see these, these, we draw these arrows, right? And it looks really like simple, but it's not. People were probably, if they were going down the coast, they probably weren't just taking a boat and going jute, 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 like this. <laughs> they were probably moving a little bit. And then the next season they'd go back up and see their family up here. And then maybe some people would go a little bit further. And uh, they heard a rumor that some of their friends found a really nice spot over here. So they'd go over there to meet them. I mean, it, and then back and forth, it was very complicated. Um, certainly after the Bering Land Bridge flooded and this, this area became um, ocean again, people for a long time maintained, well, continued to maintain 
connections by boat back and forth all the time, right? So there are migrations from America back into Siberia. Um, uh, so yeah, this, these, these arrows make it seem very simple, but it's really complicated. Um, and all these answers are correct. <laughs> so. Awesome. Um, another question, this is a follow-up um, from the DNA testing uh, question we had a little earlier. Um, do you have any thoughts on the Ancestry DNA test versus other companies tests? Is there a preferred DNA test? No, I don't. <laughs> I'm not going to endorse one over the other. I mean, and I, you know, to be honest, I don't do genetic genealogy, right? I, I, I look at, I'm selfish. I look at wide scale problems and wide scale yeah. questions, right? I don't do that. And so I'm always getting people asking me for advice and I'm like, well, you know, really, I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> I would love <laughs> to have okay. more, but I think they're both okay. Like ever, from everything I have seen of their technology, of their approaches, they're mm -hmm. both fine. And they're both equally problematic in you know, some of these other ways, right? You, don't, you just want to be careful that you're not conflating um, you know, ancestry and identity and, and that you understand the caveats here. And also understand at least 23andMe, I don't know if um, the others do this, can use, if you consent, they will use your DNA for research. So you know, if you're uncomfortable with that, make sure you know what you're signing. That's important. Okay. I have... Um... I think we have two more questions open right now, and we have five minutes left on the program, so we're going to try and get through these two. Um, are human remains in sites usually found by accident, or do archaeologists and scientists deliberately search for sites that would fit the proper conditions for preservation? I've always thought that there must be many more undiscovered sites and wondered if anyone was actively searching for them. Yes more undiscovered sites. Um, I would say archaeologists in general, from what I've observed as an outsider, really, really do not want to find human remains, um, and the, at least in the Americas. And the reason for that is when you find human remains, it's a big deal. You need to contact a tribe, you need, or, you know, whoever is the appropriate point of contact, you've got to contact whatever governmental authorities um, are needed and you stop the research and you've got to uh, stop the excavation and you talk to um, you do a lot of, of consultation, if you're doing it right, you do a lot of consultation to figure out what do you do about these remains. Um, and I describe a couple of cases that were found accidentally in the book, and I actually start with a case where they were found accidentally and, and the researchers did everything right and developed these wonderful um, relationships with tribes and fantastic research study as, as a result of that. And then another case, where it didn't go so well. And that had a lot to do with um, uh, not consulting with tribes. That being said, I have worked with archeologists who are actively trying to find human remains because that is the point of the research. And they, in, in the cases that I've worked in, um, there was a cemetery known and the uh, descendant community really wanted them to find the, the ancestors' remains and um, locate them so they could remove them first, reburial into a safer place and study them. And so our job for many seasons was to go find them. And we did, and it was really wonderful. Um, so it, you know, it's different in different situations, um, but yeah, that's, that's been my experience. A lot of times archeologists are working to look, locate, for example, a habitation site, right, a, a house, and they, you know, in that case, if they find human remains, it becomes very complicated. Um, but other times, they're they're trying to find them. If I guess that's a little wishy-washy of an answer, but that's no, no. I mean, that's good. It adds context to the discussion. I love it. Yeah. Um, so I think this is probably our last question for the evening, and this is interesting. Can you tell the diet from DNA? From DNA? Yeah. No, um, not okay. from DNA, but you can. The microbiome a little bit so you can get you can get DNA. so you can get dna when you extract dna from an ancient tooth or an ancient um bone you are extracting all the dna that is present there right so it's you know whatever can, modern dna is there whatever um soil bacteria other pathogens uh, fungal animals whatever so you could maybe get it that way um but we tend to focus just on the endogenous dna the dna that's present in the person um, yeah. You can get a diet from a lot of other pla other ways, though. Um, there are a lot of other, especially like uh, stable isotopes um, will tell you, the composition of the isotopes in a bone will tell you about diet. Awesome. All right, well, Great. we are at 7.30, so I just wanted to say thank you, Dr. Raff, for your time tonight. This has been awesome, and I have learned quite a bit. Um, I hope our viewers have, too. 
Um, there is one more question, which I will answer. Um, where can we get your book? You will see in the chat, it has been posted several times. There's another link and we'll pop that one out one more time here. I think we can do that. And uh, just again, thank you. There have been a lot of really great positive comments in the chat. Also a lot of Jayhawks in the chat too. Apparently I've seen yes, a few show up. Up, so, you know, we got you. So again, thank, thank you, you for coming everyone. Allison, I don't know if we have anything else we need to say for, um, you know, the organizational things. So I'll hand it over to you. Nope, just thank you. And it was an amazing program and people are very pleased. So thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Hopefully we'll see you on Tuesday. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.